Okay, today we continue our discussion about, uh, well, the nature of light and the arrangement of electrons uh, around the nucleus of an atom. We are finally going to be able to apply what we've learned as far as frequency, wavelength, and a little bit of energy is concerned to um, the arrangement of electrons as they um, orbit or spin around the nucleus. Now we're going to talk today about a guy named Neil Bohr, Niels Bohr, um, in his attempt to explain the hydrogen spectrum. Now we're going to come back to this and I'm going to show you guys some pictures and refer you to a video that I've created with regards to this spectrum to clear this up a bit. But in regards to that, Bohr developed his planetary model of the atom. Now remember, Rutherford had a planetary model of the atom where we had the nucleus and the electrons buzzing around, sort of like the um, planets orbit uh, the sun. Bohr's was uh, a bit more advanced than that. Uh, we'll get to it in just a few minutes. Bohr used the quantum theory, a theory of energy emission that had been stated by a German physicist, Max Planck, or Planck, it's pronounced both ways. Planck assumed that energy, instead of being given off continuously, is given off in little packets, or quanta, Quanta of radiant energy are often called photons. He further stated that the amount of energy given off is directly related to the frequency of the light emitted. Remember frequency from the previous discussions? So energy, and this alpha symbol here stands for, is proportional to nu. Remember nu, the Greek letter for frequency. So energy is proportional to the frequency um, of that light. Replacing alpha, or that proportionality sign, with an equal sign requires the introduction of a proportionality constant. So whenever we get rid of, of a proportionality sign and replace it with an equal sign, we need to add a proportionality constant. And in this case, it's the lowercase letter h. h is referred to as Planck's or Planck's constant and has a numerical value of 6.62 six two times ten to the negative thirty fourth joule seconds per photon so with that information if we know once again the energy uh, excuse me if we know the frequency of some light through Planck's constant we can calculate the energy of that light now remember frequency is the same as c over lambda so we could also say that energy is equal to h c over lambda. So it's proportional to the frequency, inversely proportional to wavelength. Remember, as frequency goes up, wavelength gets, uh, gets smaller. So let's take a look at example four. Um, in the previous video, we did a, a problem similar to this. Um, this time, we want to find the wavelength of a beam of light having an energy of 2.94 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. It's a very small amount of energy, and that would be in joules per photon, which is a massless uh, packet of radiant energy. So, remember, uh, C equals lambda nu, so nu is the same as C over lambda. And if we use this equation, E equals H times nu, we could also replace nu for C over lambda and rewrite that as HC over lambda. And once again, using our Algebra 1 skills, we can solve this equation for lambda. Let's see if I can do that. If I bring lambda over to this side and bring energy over to this side, uh, I better write this down a bit lower. Lambda would equal hc over e. Let's see, lambda I brought over here. Energy I brought down. Yeah, that looks good. So h and c are constants, remember. h is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds per photon. The velocity of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So our seconds have divided out. And then we're going to divide by the energy, which is given in the problem, 2.94 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. So now joules divide out, and we'll have our wavelength in meters per photon. So we'll be able to find the wavelength of that photon. So let's pull out our calculator here, and we'll see what we end up with. 
You guys should be good at this now. I probably don't even need to show you how to calculate this any longer, do I? So we have 6.626 uh, 6 second EE to the negative 34th times 3 second EE to the 8th. Now we're going to divide by the energy 2.94 second EE to the negative 18th. And that gives us a wavelength of 6.76 times 10 to the negative eighth meters. Okay, so that was just an example to show that if we know energy, we can find the wavelength of that light. And also, if we know wavelength or frequency, we can find the energy of that light. And that became very important to Niel Bohr in his planetary model of the atom. It's crucial that we understand the relationship between energy and the frequency or the wavelength of light. Now just a note again, I think we've mentioned this already, but as frequency increases, wavelength decreases. Now think about that, that should make sense. If the waves are hitting more often, if they're completing more cycles uh, per unit time, that means the wavelength is smaller, they must be closer together. And once again, energy would increase when that happens. So imagine if you're standing beside the ocean, right? And you're being hit by waves, right? If those waves are far apart, you're being hit with a certain amount of energy. But if those waves are closer together, right? The wavelength is smaller, the frequency is higher. You're probably gonna be knocked over more easily. This will result in more energy as we have a higher frequency and smaller wavelength. All right, so Bohr pointed out that the absorption of light by hydrogen at definite wavelengths corresponds to definite changes in the energy of the electron. He reasoned that the orbits of the electrons surrounding a nucleus must have a definite diameter. Furthermore, electrons could occupy only certain orbits. The only orbits allowed were those whose difference in energy equaled the energy absorbed when the atom was excited. What the heck does that mean? Well, let's take a look at this diagram here real quick. This is our uh, electromagnetic spectrum. We have high energy over here on the left. You'll see that the wavelength is really small. Remember, high frequency, small wavelength. And at the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have big wavelengths. And so the energy is lower. Right sort of in the middle is visible light. Invisible light has a wavelength between 400 and 700 nanometers, give or take. Remember, the smaller the wavelength, the higher the energy. So violet light has higher energy than red light. The wavelength of red light is bigger. Remember, bigger wavelength, lower energy. Now, what Bohr did is he passed electricity through a tube full of hydrogen gas. And when he did that, it lit up and he passed that light through a spectrum a diffraction gradient, which you'll see in class, actually. And he was able to see what's called an emission spectrum. The hydrogen only emitted certain colors of light, certain wavelengths of light. Now remember, wavelengths correspond to frequency, and frequency is directly proportional to the energy of that light. So if he could determine the color of light or the type of light was being, that was being emitted, he was able to determine the energy being given off. Now, he also noted that different atoms gave off different colored lights. So mercury vapor gave off a different spectrum, and neon gave off an even different spectrum. Every atom would have its own unique fingerprint, and Bohr reasoned that that was determined by the electrons that orbited the nucleus and their distance at which they orbited the nucleus. He called them energy levels. Now, there's a video on YouTube that I'm going to refer you to in just a bit that shows not only the hydrogen spectrum demo that I do, I think I also do mercury vapor and neon as well. And we'll do those in class. Now, back to Bohr. Bohr pictured the hydrogen atom as an electron circling a nucleus at a distance of about 53 picometers. He also imagined that this electron could absorb a quantum of energy and move to a larger orbit. Now, it wasn't stable there. When it moved to that larger orbit, the electron would drop from that larger orbit to a smaller one. Now, remember, if it took energy to go up, 
energy is given off as it drops down, and it gives that energy off as a photon of visible light. The energy of this photon will be exactly the same as the energy difference between the orbitals. So, in the Bohr model of the atom, if we have an electron in the first energy level, as close as it can get to the nucleus, and we excite that electron, it could jump to a higher energy level, maybe to the second, or maybe the third, or maybe even the fourth energy level. Now, that was not stable for it. It required energy to stay up there. So, it would eventually fall back down. Now, if it took energy to move up, it bore reason that energy was released as it dropped back down. Now, when it dropped back down, it released that energy as a photon of visible light. And we could see what color that light was. And once again, if we know the color, we know the energy of that light. We know the energy difference between the energy levels. And Bohr was able to calculate that to a high degree of accuracy. Now, he also noted that the electrons could never be found orbiting between energy levels. They were either on the first, the second, the third, or the fourth, but never between. Imagine, if you could, a tennis ball on a set of stairs. That tennis ball is either on the fourth step, the third step, the second step, or the first step. Wouldn't it be strange if you walked up to those stairs and found that tennis ball suspended between the second and the third step? It doesn't make sense, does it? And electrons behave the same way. They are never between energy levels unless they're moving from one to another. So, the hydrogen atom had certain energy levels. Mercury atoms have certain energy levels for their electrons. Neon atoms have certain energy levels for their electrons. It's worthy to note that the element helium was first discovered not here on Earth, that seems unusual, wasn't it? It was discovered on the sun. So think about how the element helium could be discovered on the sun. Please don't think that we launched a rocket ship and that traveled to the sun and astronauts gathered a sample of the vapor there and discovered it was helium. Think about how helium could have been discovered on the sun before it was discovered here on Earth. Now, I also want you to take a look at a few YouTube demos. The first one I want you to look at is on, my, is on my YouTube channel. And look for the hydrogen spectrum. And then there's also, I believe, the neon spectrum. And there is mercury as well. Take a look at those, um, at, at those demonstrations and listen carefully to the explanation. It's similar to the one I've just given now. And think about how the Bohr model is different than the Rutherford model. Bohr treated electrons, once again, as particles moving from one energy level to another. When they went up energy levels, it consumed energy, and when they dropped down, they gave off energy in the form of visible light. And we can see the spectrum. This is from hydrogen. Now think about why perhaps Bohr used hydrogen to do all of his work instead of mercury or neon initially. Of course, the reason for that is he only had to worry about one electron, not more than one. And the calculations were complicated enough with one electron as opposed to two or three. Just by the way, this spectrum here is another view of the hydrogen spectrum. And the one down below, uh, I believe this one is the mercury spectrum. So once again, you'll be able to see those online on my YouTube video. Okay, next time, we will continue our discussion, and we're going to change the atomic theory one more time. In fact, electrons do not behave just as particles as Bohr predicted. There are a couple of individuals that said electrons have a wave property to them, and they behave like waves instead of particles. So there's a little bit of a confrontation between the two, and there's a cute little way that we merge the two ideas together. So we'll pick that up with the next discussion. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye.